It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Mr. David Young. David is an indoor health specialist and the founder and president of InLogix Enterprises, which provides consulting and investigation services related to indoor air quality and property damage. He has his master's in public health from George Washington University, uh, and his team conducts indoor health assessments in the D.C. area. David is a valued friend and colleague of the Kaplan Center and has been for quite a while. We appreciate him coming to talk to you about how to identify and reduce risks around your home that may be impacting your health. Uh, Mr. David Young. Thank you. Thank you, John. Welcome, everybody. Uh, first, I want to thank the Kaplan Center for inviting me, Dr. Gary and uh, everybody over there. I appreciate the, uh, the welcome and look forward to uh, sharing some of our uh, wisdom that we have here. Tonight, we're uh, here to talk about integrative indoor health. So, um, let me get the controller in here. It starts at home. Um, what is uh, home? But when your kids grow up, they think about uh, being home. They gain a lot of memories. They gain a lot of security from being home. But it started way back, and uh, that was the original house. And uh, there was something based deeper in our, in our being about uh, being in a closed environment that's, that's comfortable and uh, whatnot. Now we've gotten to lo much larger houses, and a lot of things have changed. A lot of building materials, a lot of technology, a lot of systems in the in homes. And uh, we're starting to feel the effects. So let's, let's see what, um, um, discuss what home actually is first before we get into some of the uh, details of it. There's a quote by Laura, a wild, well, Laura Ingalls Wilder, uh, home is the nicest word there is. A couple other quotes I'd like to go over just to get the essence of what home is uh, before we get into some of the technical aspects. When you finally go back to your old home, you find it wasn't the old home you missed, but your childhood. Confucius says, the strength of a nation derives from the integrity of the home. And Mr. Franklin, a home is not a home unless it contains food and fire for the mind as well as the body. Miss Orman, the financial guru, says owning a home is the keystone of wealth both financial affluence and emotional security. Ms. Rosalind Carter, there's nothing more important than a good, safe, secure home. Then the last one is the strength of character may be learned at work, but beauty of character is learned at home. So pulling some of the uh, value from those statements and other quotes that you can read about home and thinking about what it means to be at home, what are the expectations of a home? <clears throat> Protection from elements, resilience of the structure for your safety, for the comfort of your family, <clears throat> emotional resilience, that's big. Uh, blending those memories, creating that childhood in that home. Wellness and uh, financial foundation for the family. So if you think about your home, what investment you put into your house that is needed to protect these rewards and every year what is that investment has it been enough over the years there's a lot of homes to protect there's a lot of homes to call home and uh, US Census from uh, data extrapolated from 20 this past year <laughs> and uh, 133 Rounded up 133 million units. That's a lot of different types of houses. And every one of them is different. Everyone's got a different structure, site plan, surfaces, the services in the house. And it gets to be pretty confusing sometimes when you're charged with going in to figure out what's going on. Or even if you're the homeowner and you're wondering what is going on with your health, why do you have brain fog? Why are you having trouble breathing or why is your children having uh, unusual symptoms? And uh, you're reading more and more online and uh, it's getting to be scary. There's a great book out um, just in the past year. It's 850 pages. It's quite a volume. But if you're interested in architecture and structure and uh, urban design, this is a fantastic buy. 
Um, it's, a, it's very informative and really opens our eyes up to all the different structures in the country, different time periods and the uh, styles that they were uh, created in. And it's a very, very informative, uh, uh, definitive guide to uh, architecture. <clears throat> so with 133 million homes, they're going to be changing over the years, over the decades. And uh, they've definitely increased from, uh, in size. Look at that increase from 1983, 1,700 square feet to, to 2013, almost 2,600 square feet. That's a lot more space to take care of. It's a lot more space to get lost in. And th those, are the, those are the average houses. <laughs> we've, we've investigated homes that are 10,000, 20,000 square feet. They have basketball courts in there, swimming pools. It's, it's a lot to take care of. And sometimes the homeowner doesn't understand all the sim uh, systems in the house and all the, the surfaces and, and uh, it can be overwhelming. And it's quite a challenge and different tradesmen, sometimes it's challenging for them to understand all the different si uh, systems and all the different parameters and settings of a house to make it run efficiently and safely for the family. <clears throat> so, Let's look at the basic concepts for evaluating a structure or a home. Um, this can all, this in, all this information can also be extrapolated to institutions, uh, to municipal governments, uh, buildings, to commercial buildings. We're just focusing on residential at this time, but it definitely has place to, uh, uh, to be extrapolated to other structures and, and purposes of the structures. But <clears throat> there's a few que there's going to be a lot of questions that we're going to uh, answer here and discuss. But um, wanted to organize the data to um, deal with the, these four questions first. And I'll go through them quickly, then we'll discuss them in more detail. So what are, the, what are indoor threats? And when, are, when do they occur? Why do these conditions and contaminants occur that create a, a problem for the in, indoor inhabitants, the occupants? And then who can benefit from and help implement healthy indoors? Let's take that first question. What are indoor threats? Now, <laughs> I tried to grasp how we're going to communicate this because in the 23 years of doing investigations, we come across a lot of different types of contaminants. <clears throat> and these, these are, uh, for the most part, the physical ones, the gases, the particulates, the radiation. <clears throat> and uh, let's take a look at some of these. We have uh, mycotoxins, endotoxins, mold, bacteria, chemicals, dander, lint from uh, dryer vents, methane gas, uh, sooting from candles, chemicals from uh, plug-in scented uh, products, mercury from um, uh, usually from uh, broken uh, light bulbs, pesticides from controlling the ants or other bugs that are in or outside the house, uh, lead paint, and it goes on and humidity goes on and on. And um, this is kind of scary. It really is kind of scary. When, you, uh, can, when, you have, when you're posed with a property loss or a health threat and you start looking online, it gets quite confusing and uh, you don't know where to start. And sometimes the most tangible thing or the one that catches your attention is the one you, you grab onto and you won't let go of it even though some of the evidence tells you that may not be your problem. And that's what we've been seeing, especially over the past few years, with uh, a lot of this information going up line and going online and uh, uh, different opinions back and forth. So you'll notice uh, my opinion down the bottom of what uh, we're seeing, especially the largest one on the bottom, which we'll discuss in more detail later. So let's look at the next question. When does the indoors, indoor environment become a risk? So, looking, struggling with this question, uh, I tried to categorize it. And what I came up with is that they're incidental, temporal, seasonal, or conditional um, timings when incidents occur and then the indoors can be a threat to your home. So let's take a look at the first one, incidental. Uh, obviously, this is storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, as I have uh, iconized there. So um, events, you know, tree on the house allowed the water intrusion to get in. 
The crack in the foundation is just an incident. It's an event. <clears throat> Temporal. This, this is especially uh, valuable when you're discussing insurance claims. Uh, because if we run into contaminants, is it related to the claim of why we were called there or what was the claim of the water loss or the fire? Or did, did this contaminant occur before the claim uh, occurred? So is it concurrent? And then you have other tension and release issues uh, for, for temporal incidents. Seasonal. A lot of contaminants or conditions are changed during the seasons. Uh, summertime has a lot of a different humidity profile than wintertime. And wintertime with the low relative humidity can be just as problematic health-wise as the high humidity during the summertime. And that's forgotten on a lot of uh, uh, people. The, dehumidif the uh, dehydration of your mucosal membranes is very significant and leads to infection, to asthma, to um, irritation. And there's a lot of things indoors that can be uh, managed to, uh, to control the humidity. So <clears throat> continuing with the, the seasonal, the, um, uh, we get most of our business during the extremes of summer. And I was trying to think of why. And uh, basically it has to do with condensation of uh, air conditioning systems, of hidden cavities and hidden systems, ductwork that goes through homes that condenses and it causes a mold problem. And uh, uh, that's where we get most of the, uh, the heat related issues. <clears throat> Conditional, this is sometimes a uh, very challenging part of our investigations. When we have a source of water with no reasonable explanation, it might, it might be above a, tu a, tub, uh, a bathroom, but it's not, all the pipes are intact, nothing's leaking, and come with enough experimentation, almost anything can be figured out. We, um, as an example, when you have a certain amount of water weight, every gallon of water is 8.35 pounds, and you put an adult male or even female in there, you get a lot of weight in a certain tub, and that can change plumbing structure, allowing a leak only at that certain time when that person is taking a bath or a, a certain person is standing in the shower, you get uh, changes in the plumbing system and only during that time. And this has uh, confused a lot of plumbers over the years. <clears throat> so taking a look at this, there's definitely something to keep in mind when you're trying to figure out maybe your own problem or a neighbor's problem and investigators or other uh, planners as to there's temporal, incidental, seasonal and conditional factors of when contaminants become or conditions become a problem in a home. So remember that as we go through the rest of the slides. So the next question is why do conditions and contaminants occur? It seems like a simple question, but when you really look at it, it's much more complex than you may think. So once again, came up with five primary categories that, uh, we, that I've lumped uh, why these, these uh, things occur. Intention, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of trauma out there. There's suicides, there's uh, homicides. I've cleaned up after a few of them, uh, help, helped firms clean up after them. But um, foreclosure, damage, intention there. There's a lot of that going around, especially other parts of the country. Uh, when people light candles or pl put in plug-in scented odorants, that's intentional. And that creates an immediate contaminant in that, in that uh, uh, indoor environment, whether it be for particulates or air, airborne chemicals. Next category is accident. Happens quite a bit. Chemical spill, misuse of chemicals, uh, putting urethane down or a different type of concentrated urethane on, on uh, flooring and an off gas for extended months or years and it's an accident. You know, tree falling on the house, it happens. Consequence. Uh, I was trying to think of a good name for this category, but its consequence is the best uh, I could come up with. Cooking, vacuuming, the material off-gassing, uh, just basically living in a house is, is uh, generating the certain activities, and that's just a consequence of the activity in that house. 
Fourth one, laws of science. And this, this is uh, pretty big, as is the last one, decay. The laws of science include gravity, condensation, the laws of thermo thermodynamics, pressure, particle dynamics. They all play a role in explaining why contaminants and conditions disperse throughout a house, why they are generated in the first place, and sometimes, uh, even if it's cleaned up, why are they still there? It could be just particle dynamics that the people cleaning it up, they don't understand how submicron, submicron and, and microscopic particles react to their actions. <coughs> Decay, wood rot, concrete spalling, etc. Uh, obviously, this is over time, but um, everything decays. Everything decays. Everything rots. Especially with, obviously, with uh, moisture uh, moving it along. So those are the primary categories of why contaminants occur. So who can use this information? Almost everybody. Occupants, patients, physicians, policy planning, disaster response industry, which is huge, a multi-billion dollar industry. Home inspectors, architects, indoor environmental professionals, that's what we do. There's so many stakeholders. Almost anybody who goes in a building uh, at one time or another can use the information that's presented here. And uh, it is. I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, movement in the healthy home industry and uh, education and things like that. And we'll discuss some of the, the uh, stakeholders and players of uh, what they're trying to do with uh, uh, the education that they're promoting. And here it is. <laughs> um, the three that I wanted to mention today, the top one is the IICRC. These guys have been around a long time. They've trained over 53,000 uh, active certified technicians and have 6,000 certified firms. This is, these guys create the national standard uh, for water and mold management in the country. And this, this is in, the standard is referenced in a lot of uh, uh, law, law uh, situations, legal situations. And uh, they're the players. They, they really know what's going on and they're the, uh, their training is outstanding. So the next guys that are BPI, Building Performance Institute. These are the um, guys who create the standards for energy audits, for uh, uh, how energy and air and humidity th move through a property, move through a house, going from your crawl space to your attic. Uh, if you have an energy problem or you think you have an energy problem, these uh, trained cert uh, certified trained professional from the BPI Institute is who you want to get out there to check it out. The last players are the International Institute for Building Biology. <laughs> These guys, I like, I like this organization. They train a lot of uh, people and they, they're a leader in electromagnetic, electrosmog, radio frequencies, uh, much more than pretty much anybody else around. They really focus a lot on electromagnetics and from what I've seen in the past handful of years for good reason. So these are the three, three primary uh, players in uh, at least what we're talking about tonight. And uh, there's a lot of valuable information on their websites. The professionals that they have trained are, uh, most of them are outstanding. Here's another one. National Center for Healthy Housing, $4 million annual budget. They, uh, a lot of this information from my presentation here, the, uh, at least some of the initial concepts come from, come from them. And uh, they do some really good work. They create, as I said, here, training courses, policy, regulatory support. They create a national healthy housing standard, and they have a lot of articles, a lot of knowledge bases, research reports, all up online. Just go and you can get hundreds and hundreds of pages, all free. They get, they're supported by the government and a lot of other uh, funding, funding parties. Obviously, a part, they're a branch of or derived from uh, U.S. HUD. <clears throat> 